It's Taj of the Beat. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to another episode of All the Above. I'm one of your co-hosts, Jeffrey Garrett, and I have been a high school social studies teacher, a middle and high school principal, and now coach school leaders here in the Los Angeles area. And as always, I am joined by... Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. And I teach history at the high school level, and I've been at it for 15 years and counting. And this is All the Above, a show where we take a look at education because media outlets don't really discuss education very much at all. And what's up with that, Jeff? What do you think? Well, what I notice is they love the scandals, right? You got the, the charter school operator that ran off with all the money. Yeah, teacher yeah. fights students. Yeah, or exactly. opposite of fights and yeah. Yeah, opposite. Uh, so they love that stuff, but I think what they're missing out on that we have the privilege of bringing folks is all the fascinating issues about education that everyone in our society has a stake in and that frankly, you're not gonna hear discussed uh, anywhere else. Exactly, exactly. So take a look at the description box. There's links in there to our podcast if you want to listen on the go and to our website where you can find all the past episodes and our Facebook page. And if you haven't already, please make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. Now for today, Jeff, what's on the agenda? Well, we got another good one for you folks. Uh, we're going to kick off, as we usually do, with our Do Now, getting into some of those fascinating headlines in education. And then for our seminar today, we have, I think, a, a controversial discussion. There has historically always been this tension in our profession between teachers and administrators and sort of the idea that administrators maybe uh, forgot what it's like to be a teacher and kind of mm -hmm. lose perspective or, uh, you know, teachers maybe uh, are too hard on their administrators or maybe aren't necessarily pulling, uh, you know, pulling their weight at certain times. And so uh, we're going to we're going to get into those uh, some of those controversial issues today and, and talk about them. So it should be a fun one. Absolutely. But first, let's check out the do now to see what's going on in the news in education. All right, now let's get to the do now. Let's look at some of these headlines in education. Jeff, how are we doing the do now today? Well, we got a roll call today, Manuel. It's time roll to uh, take attendance, see who's in the building. Nice, nice, awesome. Yeah. So who we got first? First up today, we have Pittsburgh Public Schools, PPS. Ah, in Pittsburgh house. in the house. Yep. Rest in peace, Mac Miller. So fascinating study out of uh, Pittsburgh that was recently put out by the Rand Corporation looking at the implementation of restorative justice practices uh, in the Pittsburgh Public Schools. And uh, it's an interesting study because it's looking at the effectiveness of restorative justice practices as measured by reductions in suspension rates and also um, school culture using a teacher survey. Mm -hmm. And they also stack that up next to uh, potential impacts on academic outcomes. So really interesting variables they're, they're taking into consideration there. Yeah, dope. And they looked at schools that were using these particular practices and compared the data with schools that were not using these particular practices. And they found that schools that are using these uh, restorative justice practices saw an overall decline in the suspension rate amongst uh, all students and a narrowing of the suspension gap between black students and white students, which is very promising. And in addition, teachers reported uh, feeling much more uh, positive about the school climate and the school culture at schools that use these practices. Yeah, in fact, they found that in schools that did implement restorative justice practices, uh, African-American students in particular mm -hmm. were um, four and a half times uh, as likely to um, be suspended uh, mm -hmm. by the end of the implementation of this year-long uh, program. And uh, in schools that did implement restorative practices, that number dipped to three and a half times as likely. Right. So. Still, Still a, a gap problem. there, yeah. right? But obviously some closing of the gap, so right. that's, that's promising. On the other hand, uh, there were was, there was some interesting questions or maybe doubtful results uh, raised at the secondary level. Most of the schools in the study were elementary schools, and they found that for, for high schools, they didn't have good enough data to make right. any conclusions. But for middle school, the improvements in culture continued, but actually academic achievement dipped. So... Um, yeah perhaps some reason to be concerned. There. And suspension rates weren't, um, didn't decline nearly um, like they did at the elementary school level. Um, definitely reason for concern. Um, I know for myself, I'm still 
uh, feel pretty good about the fact that teachers responded well to these practices because one of the uh, really controversial aspects of restorative justice practices are, um, you know, complaints from teachers that, you know, they feel handcuffed. They feel like they can't uh, discipline students who get out of line because of uh, this reason or whatever. So to see that, that teachers who have been trained in these practices and implement these practices feel better about the school climate. If teachers are feeling better, um, you better believe students are probably feeling better too. Yeah. Yeah, I all similarly felt like that was uh, a promising finding. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it did raise a bunch of questions for me about how restorative justice practices are being implemented. Right. Um, I often find that, uh, to me, using suspension as a metric to evaluate the effectiveness of restorative justice practices is, is problematic on a few fronts. One, it's often measured apart from any, uh, uh, any reliable data from teachers about is the school climate actually improving? So this study right. did attempt to address that. On the other hand, I'd be curious to know what kinds of policies are in place in the state of Pennsylvania or in Pittsburgh public schools that actually mandate or are forcing a reduction in suspensions right. that um, would be happening whether the school is implementing restorative practices at all. So the, the right. cause effect relationship there may not be quite as uh, direct as it might sound right. when you when you first read into it. And that's a great point. Um, I mean, the, the study, they, the authors do recommend that more training be implemented and more time be set aside for teachers to get better at, at mastering restorative justice techniques. Um, but the narrowing of the suspension uh, gap between students, you know, regardless of if uh, suspension rates might be going down, they're going down in California, they're going down in a lot of areas because of, of changes to uh, uh, policies, but um, a narrowing of the gap is very promising, especially at the, for me, I'm thinking at the elementary school level, if there's anywhere that it needs to be narrowed, I mean, that's the beginning of the pipeline, the school yeah. to prison pipeline, pipeline sure. starts somewhere. So for the gap to be narrowing there is incredibly promising. And I hope that the district takes um, the author's um, advice and, and invest even more in these practices. Yeah, well, I would build on that even further and say there are implications, huge implications for districts across the country because oh, yeah. we have a lot of, uh, you know, places that have declared themselves to be restorative practitioners as a district or as a school without anywhere near the necessary investments in yeah. teacher training and support, um, you know, infrastructure in school, like staff who are going to spend time talking with kids instead right. of just writing up kids and sending them home and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, th there's promising results here. We need equally promising investments in the resources it's going to take to do restorative justice well. Yeah, absolutely. It's become a bit of a, a buzzword around uh, education circles. And you're, you're right, a lot of schools claim it or, or have it on their websites, but are they really doing it the way right. it's supposed to be done? Yeah. All right, so next up on our role for today, we have... Boston valedictorians. Mm. What's cracking with the valedictorians, man? Well, a really fascinating, fascinating report came out um, done by the Boston Globe called the Valedictorian Project. And what they did is they looked at Boston's top uh, graduates from uh, the graduation year 2005 through 2007 to see where they ended up in life, which is, you know, really intriguing because, you know, when I think about valedictorians having been a teacher, you know, I think about the speech and man, that kid's going somewhere. And then I kind of move on to the next set of students to come by. So they took a look, took a look at where these uh, students ended up and um, they found some, some results that aren't actually that, um, that great. Uh, one for one, they found that a quarter of Boston's valed valedictorians from 2005 to 2007 did not finish college within uh, mm. six years. Yeah. A quarter. A quarter, uh, which is crazy. Crazy, like yeah. when you think about that, right? Like these are literally the, top, the, top. the few dozen top performing right. students in the entire district. Um, on a personal note, I guess I'll also just share, since both of us did our student teaching yeah. uh, in Boston public schools, at around well, this was Cambridge public okay. schools. Okay. Well, I did mine. Shout out to Cambridge. Uh, sorry, my, my memory faded on that one. Yeah. Uh, but I did mine in Boston public schools mm -hmm. uh, and I'm imagining, you know, I might have might have taught uh, one of these that, students. Here, I right? did, yeah, uh, that, yeah, you're right. Yeah, in my in my baby fledgling teacher days, but uh, it just gave me a you know a moment of pulling on the heartstrings, especially thinking about this. So, in addition to uh, the, the statistics you just shared about mm. college graduation, even thinking about some of their aspirational goals, there was there was a bunch of troubling statistics. So, um, you know, they found that today, forty percent of those valedictorians um, still earn less than fifty thousand dollars a year in terms of salary. That none of them 
um, actually went on to earn a medical degree or to uh, you know graduate from uh, from medical school. Even though a lot a of them claim that that's what they wanted to do or aspire to do. Yeah, yeah, and um, we're you know I, I think this just gives like a really sobering picture of uh, you know perhaps some of the gaps in opportunity and in achievement that are baked into. Uh, you know, this is one of our larger urban school districts in the country, but also one of our most well-resourced right. urban districts in the country also. So, um, yeah, and four of these valedictorians um, ended up homeless or were homeless for a time. And um, results for valedictorians that were in some of the more suburban areas of, of Boston Public Schools were, were much better. And valedictorians from Boston's elite exam schools fared phenomenally well. So mm -hmm. that also shows within the district the disparity of, of experiences um, for the top graduates from each school. Yeah. Yeah. And that none of the valedictorians from non-exam schools went to or were accepted by Harvard right. uh, is an interesting anecdote unto itself, right? The sort of elite Ivy League school right across the river, you know, yeah. presumably some sense of connection and investment with, with Boston Public Schools, but... Um, not accepting any of their even their top students, right? So, yeah. um, interesting. I, you know, we don't necessarily have data on uh, what this would look like if a comparable study had been done, say here in Los Angeles right. or in uh, you know New York City or Chicago or other uh, large urban districts across the country. But um, my gut instinct is we probably wouldn't see yeah. data that's a whole lot better. Right. Again, that that is, you know, perhaps just conjecture there, but uh, it didn't it rang to me as sad and, and disappointing right. about the state of affairs in our work, but not necessarily unusual. Yeah, and I, I agree. I mean, the authors correctly point out that for those valedictorians that went off to college and, and, and didn't persist, they were, uh, quote unquote, doubly disadvantaged in terms of being low income and coming from a family background that didn't have a lot of um, exposure to college and being first generation college students and I think that you'll find the same thing in uh, Los Angeles schools, New York schools and it just goes to show that um, no matter how hard students work and how, how hard they, they, they you know, achieve in school to, to be top in their class, still I mean the, the challenges that await them and the barriers that are set up for them um, in our society are, are incredibly difficult to overcome so those same valedictorians that give those uplifting speeches, you know, they need a lot more support past graduation day for sure. Yeah. 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 And I think there's real questions for us to think about what are we doing in classes that's that's leading to valedictorian status, right? Or that's leading that to those messages about uh, proficiency and excellence uh, in, in terms of a student's academic performance. And are we perhaps sending some misleading messages along, along the way? Yeah. Right. Are we are we saying because you're you know quiet and nice and you work hard? that that is the same thing as actually having mastered a yeah. certain set of skills, right, or content. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All right, fascinating stuff. Um, go to our website for a link to that report. It's, it's, uh, it's re really interesting stuff. Yeah. All right, uh, last, last up, up, last up. Um, this is obviously big news for us here in California, um, and we welcome everybody else into the conversation, but uh, Gavin Newsom is here today. Gavin Newsom, uh, the, well, governor. the governor, the governor. The uh, governor. So former lieutenant governor, now governor of the state of California, Gavin Newsom, has been making uh, headlines, certainly here in California, and I think uh, to some extent nationally, um, with his push for expanding early education uh, opportunity and services here in the state of California. So Governor Newsom has uh, put forward a multi-year plan, I believe a three-year plan, to achieve universal um, pre-kindergarten in the state of California um, for all low-income students. Um, in an attempt to implement his campaign promise, um, which pledged to make essentially the, the largest expansion of early education services in the history of the state of California, which I would have to assume would make it the largest expansion, uh, perhaps nationally, given the outsize right. uh, nature of the state of California. So tell us a bit more about this, man. Yeah, and his, his first budget proposal sets aside billions of dollars for this. So it wasn't just all campaign talk. He's, he's putting some numbers behind it. And um, California had been increasing funding over the last uh, several years for full day uh, preschool slots, but he's looking to expand that. And it's looking like uh, the focus right now um, perhaps will be on expanding the kindergarten portion of it. Again, this is a, a multi-year plan. And I think it's really promising. I mean, research 
shows again and again the benefits of, of a preschool education and the benefits of a quality early childhood education. Um, one concern that I have, of course, is, is, is the quality of that education in the sense that uh, there's studies out there, one uh, notably by a, uh, that came out of Rutgers that shows that the um, quality of or that early childhood experience has, has a lot to, to say on, on where the student ends up in terms of their overall achievement. Um, Duke University put out a, a, a study that showed that a lot of times low income and, and children of color are in kindergarten classes that are not at the same level as other students and that definitely shows that we got to talk about quality, not just access, but what's actually happening in those classrooms. Yeah. So interestingly enough, uh, I would expand the conversation about quality to also mm -hmm. say, you know, there, there's a supply and demand uh conundrum that we have to resolve here too. We've done some earlier uh, reporting on our show uh, in our first season about some of the, the problems um, that we have in, in not only compensating preschool uh, right. educators fairly and well um, in a way that's going to bring and retain, uh, you know, quality folks into the profession, but also like to m dramatically expand uh, this program in short order might also mean Who's going to teach yeah. these classes? Where are these classes going to exist? Now, to his credit, Gavin Newsom has thought about this, you know, this three-year plan of implementation, mm -hmm. and, and which is going to allow funding and time to build out facilities and to do training and credentialing of, right. of staff. But I think, you know, three years still might be somewhat ambitious. Uh, you know, we yeah. had the, the major expansion of uh, universal pre-K in, in New York City, uh, you know, several years back that uh, has has taught us some valuable lessons, right? right? Like just saying, we're gonna do this doesn't mean that we have quality people ready to teach in every classroom and facilities that are ready to be a great place for kids to, to go and learn. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, absolutely. I think there's gonna definitely be some, um, you know, a, a, some challenges ahead for making this happen. Um, it's definitely promising to see California going in that direction. And, and there's already talk on the campaign trail um, regarding universal pre-K as sort of a, a a um, uh, policy proposal, uh, Julian, Cast Julian Castro and his uh, presidential announcement, I guess we could call it, um, talked about his dedication to having universal pre-K as a national policy. So I think you know, as, as time goes on, we're going to hopefully see greater access to preschool uh, through kindergarten for, for all students, no matter their income. So that's promising. I'm glad California is somewhere in there leading the way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, to be clear, uh, I think it's a good idea for us to expand uh, these supports and services to our youngest kids, particularly with the lens on equity for low income students. Right. We know are often denied the most opportunity, the greatest amount of opportunity to learn. And so I appreciate the focus on this. Um, if the end result is a poorly implemented program, we yeah. will have spent a lot of money getting very little results. So the stakes true. are high for, for all of us and particularly, I'm sure, for Gavin Newsom politically with this. But um, I appreciate the, yeah. the, the strong push forward and let's, let's do it and let's do it well. Big money for poor results. Does that, does that ever happen in education, Jeff? Come on, man. Never. Not nah, a man, single. Hey, in, in 2014, we officially left no child behind and everyone was proficient. They all with us. I think. I mean, because Every, of the great leadership of George W. Bush. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm sure. Old W. Yes. <laughs> all right, folks. That about does it for today's Do Now. And up next is going to be our segment on teacher and administrator relations. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. This goes out to all those school administrators out there, principals, assistant principals, all of y'all. We teachers, we do appreciate you, but regarding your practice, we have some thoughts. Dear administrators, do you even know what it's like to be a teacher? I mean, we know you used to work in the classroom, but that was like a long time ago. That was like overhead projectors and transparency markers and those projectors that you used to have to click to go to the next slide. Are you still in touch with what it's like to be on the front lines? Trust us, the classroom has changed. These students today, they're a little different than the ones back in the 80s and 90s and whenever you were a teacher. Dear administrators, you talk about all these great, interactive, engaging teaching practices that we should use, but when y'all lead a staff meeting, you're not using any of those practices. I'm sitting there struggling to stay awake. What kind of modeling is that? And by the way, a lot of those staff meetings, they could have just been an email. Not sure why we had to sit there and hear about upcoming events or changes to our attendance procedures or changes to staff parking. You know how busy we are? 
I got to type up all these lesson plans. Unless you're willing to take these post-it notes that I got. I mean, my best ideas are kind of laid out. They're a little scrambled, but they'll work. Just package them together. I could walk you through it. Dear administrators, we know we're just teachers, but we've got ideas too. Why don't you ever ask us about ways to move our school forward? Why can't teachers be part of the decision-making process? Is our classroom experience not worth enough to you? Stop assuming you know more than we do just because of your title and your years of education and the certifications and all the additional trainings and all that extra stuff. Okay, maybe you know a little bit more, but still we have ideas too. Dear administrators, when you come by our rooms, why do y'all just walk in and not say anything to anybody? You sit there in the corner with your laptop or clipboard and you look all serious and students are a little bit freaked out. That vibe that you give off, that's not it. And how come you administrators don't ever happen to walk in our classrooms during those magical, mind-blowing, transformative moments that we have with our students? Do you purposely only come in at the worst times when little Johnny is running around or someone's got gum stuck to their hair? Because trust us, some really good stuff happens in between all that craziness, and you never happen to be around for that. Dear administrators, you say it's all about the students, but it's always test scores, test scores, test scores with y'all. We get it, we have targets to reach, but you know there's more to learning than that, right? Look, we know being an administrator is difficult, but that's why you make the big bucks. Okay, not really big bucks. We know you work more hours and more days than we do, and if you break it all down by the hour, you probably make less than you did as a teacher, but still, you chose to do that, and your, your paycheck is larger than ours. We do wonder, though, how do you go to every school event? It's like you live here. Like, do you have a change of clothes here and shower in the locker room? How do you do that? Are you taking care of yourself? Do you have a life outside of this school? Look, we respect you, we just think you ought to put yourself in our shoes sometimes. Have a conversation with us. Get to know us. You have some teaching ideas? Come to our rooms and model them for us. Want to make change and put your stamp on our school? Advocate for us when those big wigs downtown lay out their directives. Advocate for our kids. Fight the system with us. Right now, when we look at you, you kind of look like the system. Was that always your dream? Oh, and if you really want to get in our good graces, how about you stop by and check in to say hi? No clipboard, no laptop, just a hello. Maybe even spot us for a few minutes so we can run to the bathroom real quick. That teacher bladder, it's strong, but even it needs some support sometimes. Wow, man. Well, you, uh, you hit us. Hit us with a lot there. Uh, t tell them why you're yeah. mad, son. Tell them why you're mad. <laughs> to, to be fair, that was a generalization of very common teacher uh, complaints that I've either had or heard from others. And my particular administrators in my particular case, uh, my principals for sure, my, uh, for most of my career, have been quite awesome. Uh-huh. Okay. So this is general. Good, so good to know. It'll take Important a personal. disclaimer. It'll take a personal. <laughs> Important disclaimer. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, behind some of the, uh, you know, the, the humor there is, is also like some really interesting questions about our profession right. and some of the tensions that I think often come up, uh, you know, having been a principal and received plenty of uh, questions, complaints otherwise about right. my about my own practice, uh, but also having worked with administrators across the country, seeing, you know, some of the very things you mentioned, like play yeah. out um, in schools. And, and uh, so, you know, this being one of the very unique spaces in media where we have a teacher and uh, an administrator uh, sitting here together, let's, right. let's get into it. Um, yeah, you know, let's do it. Let's do it on a few of these topics, at least. So you mentioned, uh, something that I thought was really interesting mm -hmm. and is always challenging, I think, which is the, the staff meeting, right. uh, issue. Right. Um, yeah. and so what, what's up with the whack pedagogy at, Man. uh, at these staff meetings? What's, what's your experience or what's the experience that, you know, right. teachers have shared with you? So I've worked at Three in, within three different districts, if you put the uh, whole 15 years of my career together, and, and all three had mandated staff meetings, usually either before school or after school, and in those cases, it's all the teachers sitting in auditorium, or all the teachers sitting in the cafeteria, or a library, and basically listening the whole time to a bunch of stuff that's boring. And I have thought multiple times in my career that, hmm, if I hadn't gone to a staff meeting for the last two or three years, would anything be different about what happens mm -hmm. in my classroom? Mm -hmm. and I've had that thought. Not recently, but there have been times in my career where I've realized, man, I could have missed all those joints and been fine. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, I think on a certain level, there's, um, there's just a basic reality to the fact that, like, 
maybe your garden variety faculty meeting is mm. not the most exciting part of uh, right. of anyone's day, right. administrators included. Uh, but I think if we include into that, you know, uh, full faculty meetings in general, mm. right? So like full staff professional development, actual yeah. faculty meetings. Um, you know, there's 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 a lot going on behind the scenes that might give at least some explanation to what's taking place. So one is, um, you know, there are a bunch of things that administrators are mandated to do with the whole staff mm. that they don't always have choice over. So, mm. you know, there are uh, various types of trainings about child abuse awareness or um, right. bloodborne pathogens and how to handle, you know, fluids that might right. uh, result if someone is cut or whatever. Um, you know, uh, anti-bullying kinds of things that, uh, that, you know, are difficult to do really well uh, with a whole staff, particularly at a large mm -hmm. comprehensive high school, which, you know, right. uh, includes, includes your uh, working environment where you have a large group of teachers and, you know, it's, it's difficult to do yeah. that in like an, an intimate way. Um, I would also say, though, that, you know, sort of disclaimer aside, uh, we have an issue with, with um, you know, poor quality meetings, from my perspective at least, mm. what, I, what I tend to see generally. And I think there's some reasons for that. Uh, some are structural challenges, like administrators don't get a lot of time to plan those meetings, right? right. Um, and so if you think about the little amount of time the teachers get to plan, Administrators don't get a prep period at all. Right. Uh, you know, your average administrator is lucky to be able to sit down and get lunch. Um, and so... A lot of the teachers out there are grumbling right now. They have to plan for multiple classes a day, every single day. These are meetings that are once a week or once a month or once every other week, depending on the district. Yeah. And teachers also are lucky if they get to sit down for lunch. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm you know, not discounting that. Yeah. Just saying the, the struggle is real on both sides right, of the Right, fence. right, right. Uh, on that front. And so, you know, oftentimes when administrators are thinking about where to prioritize their time, uh, you know, responding to an email that a teacher has sent or responding to a concern about a, you know, a particular student or right. those sorts of things tend to take priority over the pedagogical moves I might right. make in this faculty meeting when at the end of the day, I'm, I'm responsible for communicating this information and getting everyone to sign off, um, you know, or or, or that sort of thing, right. right? Not saying it's good, but saying, you know, I think that's, that's part of the challenge we have, uh, you know, as, as a profession. Yeah, yeah, no, and understood, understood. Um, you know, I, I wonder at times, you know, another teacher I, I came across on, on Twitter, I don't remember the teacher's name, unfortunately, but um, he questioned why we're expected as teachers to raise critically, critical thinkers who are engaged in the process, and yet teachers themselves, their critical thinking is, is hardly solicited and their engagement during these meetings is hardly solicited. And, you know, for some of the reasons that you mentioned in terms of the, the lack of planning, because, you know, as teachers, we know to, to develop a, a strong lesson or a unit that engages students and um, allows them to, to, you know, really be creative with their um, approach and their critical thinking takes a lot of time. Yeah. So, I mean, if an administrator is, has this list of, of topics that have to be covered and the meeting's coming up in a couple of days, it makes sense that it's not gonna be like some really phenomenal pedagogical practices happening there. Yeah, yeah. I will say what I tend to see uh, in the schools that I work with most closely mm -hmm. around the professional development side of things has been, uh, particularly in recent years, but a strong move away from the, you know, sort of principal sage on the stage mm -hmm. uh, lecture of professional development to a model that uh, differentiates more by, mm -hmm. by department or grade level and also that empowers more teachers on staff to lead uh, professional development to be the voices of those meetings. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's something that you uh, see or have experienced right. at, you know, at your current school or in the past, but it's definitely a, a growing trend that I've seen working in a few districts across the country that, um, you know, I, I don't have data to, to suggest one way or other, other than my anecdotal observations, but, um, you know, to sort of empower lots of voices to be able to step up and, and contribute and ensure that that time is better constructed as a good shared professional learning experience rather right. than a, you know, thrilling lecture from <laughs> Principal Garrett. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, and how about some of the other things that, that, that came up? Some, some of those other 
common teacher gripes. Um, yeah, so you, you talked about the, um, the voice of teachers and in, in leadership and decisions in the schools. Mm -hmm. And so this is one I had lots of strong um, responses and, and thoughts about. Mm -hmm. um, Namely, that there's all kinds of teacher voice and leadership in in uh, in schools that certainly that that I work with. But um, you know, I want to want to check my defensive <laughs> impulse right here and, and say before I react. Um, so you know, explain your position a little more. Why? What's the issue with teachers not being involved in, right. in leadership decisions? Well, in my 15 years in the classroom, there's I could you know make a laundry list of different. Um, approaches or initiatives or, or, or procedures or policies or any of that um, that I've been told and that other teachers have been told from top down and we're left like looking at each other like where did this come from or what's the reason for this and who was involved in the process mm -hmm. and you know it's for sure probably not unique to, to education this idea of decisions being made and the people on the front line sort of not being not feeling like they've been part of that decision and they're the ones who are asked to like make it happen and, and put it into action um, so I don't think that's unique to our schools but it's definitely a very common sentiment um, my dissertation was on teacher leadership and and you know research shows that in a lot of cases teachers feel that um, they want opportunities to be more involved, but they feel that those opportunities are few and far between, uh, separate from being like a department chair, and then kind of that's it. Yeah. So, I, you know, I have a lot of thoughts on this. I think um, one is, on a certain level, I think there's just a, an inherent existence of this tension that is going to be there no matter what, right? That like always between sort of manager and and Right. Those being managed, whether we're talking about folks who are, you know, cashier in a Target or whether we're talking about, you know, folks who are junior attorneys in the in the law firm, um, you know, all across the kind of workplace spectrum. There's that inherent tension of feeling like, you know, ma the, the voice of the people that I work with is mm -hmm. not being elevated to the decision making level right. in an organization, right? And even within school systems, there's often the tension of like, well, where's principal's voice when the folks at the district office are sending down all these mandates from right. on high or the superintendent's out of touch and hasn't been in a building for how long or, right. you know, and so, um, so I think some of it is just an inherent issue that happens when the reality is we're all busy people doing our jobs and mm -hmm. in education those jobs physically happen in separate spaces right so we're not even privy to like overhearing the the work and the conversation of the other party throughout the course of the day that that leads to a little bit of a vacuum right, right. so like i don't know what was taking place and usually when there's a vacuum it gets filled by my negative assumptions about what must have happened, right? right? It must be that they're just out of touch or this kind of thing, um, which is not to dismiss the fact that there are some folks who are out of touch, right? But, but I think there's an inherent challenge there. The other thing is, I, you know, I honestly um, uh, objectively have seen in, in my career at least lots and lots of opportunities for teacher leadership. And I would even say I have seen, so, so that definitely includes department chair and grade level chair and right. some of the like very formalized positions that exist in most uh, schools and districts that you mentioned. But um, there are also formalized committees, right? School leadership teams or local school leadership councils or whatever the, the acronym is for them in, in your particular district. Most public school districts have some kind of multi-stakeholder committee that's expected to exist at most of the schools that includes teachers and staff and administration and parents and for high schools or middle schools even sometimes students that's empowered to help inform the decisions of the school. Now I'll be first to say that a lot of times those bodies are either somewhat dysfunctional and or um, their, their impact on what's taking place in the school mm -hmm. is often around like operational kinds of stuff and budgeting. And not that that stuff's unimportant, right. but that stuff doesn't always necessarily touch the things that people actually care most about in the lived experience of, of the school day. Right. Um, but beyond that, um, the, frankly, I would say the problem that I have seen more often than not is that to fill all of the teacher leadership opportunities in a school, that schools have a smaller subset of teachers who are being overtapped, yeah. right? Um, because other people either are, have life obligations or not interested or whatever, right. um, but like the same people keep getting tapped to be in those leadership roles right. and they get tired and burnt out, right? Yeah, and so problem, you have right? leadership roles that are unfilled, right? right? And so 
you know, I get the like the feeling that your voice isn't being heard, but I also feel like when I look around, what I see is 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 not that. What I see right. is opportunities that exist and too few people to fill all the opportunities mm. uh, that exist. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm definitely hoping some of our viewers chime in on their um, for those of our viewers who are currently classroom teachers on their experiences about. Um, perceived leadership opportunities at their school. Cause I've worked at different schools and you know, the school I'm at currently, I definitely feel like there's pathways for teachers to have leadership roles and, and give input. Our administrators reach out a lot for our input, but I've been at other places where it's, it's not that at all. So I'm yeah. in interested in hearing what the rest of the audience thinks because you know, I, my perspective is limited to the few sites that I've been at. And I know our, our, we have viewers all across you know, the nation that have different perspectives and, and definitely looking forward to that. I also am looking forward to your explanation as to why I have to type out my lesson plans, planning. <laughs> is that even important? I'm not, I mean, I know what I'm doing. Just trust me, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Just trust me. Yeah, so I, I have strong feelings about this one too. Mm -hmm. And I, I will be honest that there's a slice of the type out your lesson plan and or have a standard whiteboard configuration that a right. lot of schools have, or you know, you have your standard and objective and those sorts of things on the, on the board that is about uh, really is about like adult mm. audience, right? It's for people like me who come right. into the classroom and need to be able to access what's taking place without pulling you out of your lesson for five minutes to have a discussion about it, right? right. So there is a piece of it that's more transactional in that way. Um, however, the larger piece about it is because there's a disappointing number of people in our profession that don't plan. No. So, uh, <laughs> I, you know, now... There are also all kinds of conditions that make it, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but um, they certainly work against the type of professional culture that I think you and I would both hopefully agree on being the, the right way for us to exist. Um, you know, I know some folks who've worked in Texas, and this is just one example. I know there are other places around the country, but teachers who really felt like I am mandated to teach this sort of step-by-step, teach-by-numbers curriculum, right. so planning isn't really part of the professional practice because I'm right. really just in the business of figuring out where I need to be in the provided curriculum. Right. Uh, personally, I'm not a fan of that uh, way of being as a professional practitioner, even with a, an adopted curriculum that maybe is very good. Uh, you still need to make adjustments and considerations right. for the students you have that um, you know are unique and different in their needs. Um, but also beyond that, the many places around the country where teachers have a lot more um, curricular freedom, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we just have a disappointing professional culture, I would say, right now around the need for real rigorous planning. And I have seen in too many places examples where folks are actually not sufficiently planned to meet the needs of the student and the content that they're teaching. And so... You know, I, to me, the, the question is, like, why shouldn't a person have a typed lesson plan, right? right? Like, in this day and age, I think that's the equivalent of, you know, a surgeon going into surgery with, like, no plan for what they're going to do to fix your knee or whatever, right? Like, this is, teaching is incredibly complex work. There's, you should have a plan for, right, <laughs> for right, right. how you want to get it done today, right? Like, what are we hoping kids are going to get today? And how are we going to know if they got there? What are the moves I'm going to make to ensure that happens, right? Like these are not uh, surprising or difficult or un, uh, you know, unnecessary asks right. of, a, of a teacher in my mind. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely see your point there. And one thing that I've noticed in my own experience is that a lot of times the teachers who are specifically being asked to talk about lesson plans are being asked that because of either challenges that they've had in their classroom or their newness to the profession. Um, I've seen a lot of administrators um, when it's a, a teacher who has done stellar work for, for quite a while, um, not, I've seen a lot of administrators not really press for that written lesson plan to be delivered on time every week or every day, uh, so much as just, you know, a different type of monitoring for that teacher. Uh, I can imagine with there being, I don't know, however, however many hundreds of thousands of teachers across the nation, that there are people who, you know, wake up and saunter into the classroom and think, okay, so what's the plan for today? Especially people who, for whom teaching wasn't their first career choice, and that's a whole another topic. Actually, I think maybe Maybe the next episode we could discuss maybe you know, the different reasons why people enter the profession um, because I think that plays a role also in teachers' um, investment in their own planning and their own daily planning and their um, thoughts about whether or not it requires rigorous daily planning or it's just, it's teaching, anyone can do it. Yeah.
Yeah. All right. So any other thoughts about one day, maybe we'll get you to do a, a, a Dear Teachers segment, although, you know, that might play into the, the, the negative n narrative of administrators yeah, and all that. I don't know no, about no, that no, one, no. man. I, I don't know. I will say, um, you know, I think uh, an interesting phenomenon that exists in our profession that connects to this tension is mm -hmm. that uh, every administrator, or at least every administrator that I'm aware of across the nation, mm -hmm. has been a teacher. Most teachers, the vast someone's majority, someone's going to comment like, "Hi, no, no, have, have uh, yeah, someone's going to comment, right?" And I'm sure there's like a charter school or whatever that has some lawyer who became a principal, <laughs> and that exists. I yeah. get it, but the vast majority, the right. long-standing norm is that every principal, right, or assistant principal, had to have been a teacher, um, and so what what we have as a little bit of a, a phenomenon is principals and and assistant principals who do have experience and know what it's like to teach. But most teachers have not been administrators. Oh, and, a and a lot of teachers don't even have like the, the perspective when you do like classroom walks with people on like what's actually happening with the teacher down the hall, right? right? And so it's a very eye-opening experience to become an administrator and get that kind of school-wide experience. And it, it does impact mm. how you think about decision-making in a way that um, I think is, is probably a little bit hard to um, to empathize with or understand if you if you haven't walked in in those right. shoes and so there's like a little bit of a weird imbalance uh, in the equation which which doesn't give administrators the right to lose touch and forget the importance of teachers and, and a lot of the you know legitimate criticisms about poor leadership from administrators but it is an interesting thing where you know like I was a teacher and I, I do know what that's like. I, I also have been a principal. I know what that's like and I can make some some comparisons. All right. That actually in a roundabout way reminds me of uh, something Ice T said. He was he was talking about young people and how they think they know everything and he was like, I've been your age before, but you've never been my age. So stop <laughs> acting like you know it all. Yeah, I I mean <laughs> It's a good analogy. Yeah. I don't mean to suggest that like yeah, yeah, administrators yeah. know better than like the young foolish teachers. That's not right, my right. point. Um, but right. there's a there is something about the dynamic that maybe is a little bit similar. Just because um, you know it's uh, yeah. everybody who's become an administrator knows the moment when you're like, oh, there's a, I have a whole different perspective now yeah. on what I thought was happening in school. All right. Yeah. All right, folks, chime in below. Let us know. We know we have some administrators watching. What, what, what would you like to, to, to say in response to some of the, some of the comments that were in our uh, Dear Administrators segment and teachers? Am I, am I alone in this? Chime in. Let us know your perspective and what you think. And um, next up is our Class Dismissed. Okay, now it's time for Class Dismissed. If you made it all the way to Class Dismissed and you haven't hit that subscribe button, what are you thinking? Please hit that for us and remember to enable the notifications so that you don't miss any upcoming episodes. And now for Class Dismissed, we'd like to shout out special events and special people and special ideas in education. Jeff, who are we or what are we shouting out today? All right. Well, uh, we are in the midst of filming this episode on Martin Luther King Day weekend, which, uh, you know, of course, is in and of itself uh, a special occasion. But this weekend is also, I, I think, a really noteworthy weekend in American history. Uh, on Friday, we had the Indigenous Peoples March uh, in D.C. And, uh, you know, just a, a powerful uh, expression of the you know, the need to pay attention to and to support our indigenous brothers and sisters in, in their struggle for, indeed, for justice indeed. and equality. We also then on Saturday, uh, which we are we are now missing right now. It's hurting my soul a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. But the Women's March uh, taking place. And uh, for folks that maybe didn't know, here in Los Angeles, we have had, I think, the biggest or certainly among the biggest women's marches over yep. the last two years. We've had, uh, in each of the last two years, over half a million people turn out in the streets of downtown Los Angeles. Um, so huge uh, and, and a really incredible march um, taking place. And then, of course, we've got the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday on Monday, which right. uh, in many 
schools across the, 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 the region here and across the country is also thought of more as a day of service um, than, a, than a day off. So all these really big uh, holidays and marches giving a great opportunity to engage young people, um, which many, many educators are, in fantastic discussions about um, equality and power and politics in our country. And so we want to give a shout out to all the young people um, who are getting engaged uh, this weekend and who are not uh, necessarily taking a day off, but a, but a day on and an opportunity to learn about social movements and organizing. Um, so just beautiful expressions of, of democracy and, and, and in the best sense, hopefully what it means to, to be an American. So. Um, shout out to all the young folks yes. getting engaged yes. and the educators helping to make that happen. Absolutely. All right, folks, that's it for this episode of All the Above. Remember, check out the links in the description to get to our website and see all the previous episodes and, and listen to the podcast versions if you like to listen on the go. And also remember, please leave a comment below. Let us know what you think about our discussion about teachers and administrators and uh, some of the misconceptions or perceptions that exist between the two. All right, so we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.